You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Do you know, it's about 50 years ago, round about now, since the most extraordinary run of ill luck that ever affected anybody on stage happened to Frank Zappa. Do you remember that? Well, do you remember this? Oh, I, I remember it vividly. I can remember reports in the music papers. 1971 December, wasn't it? That the, the uh, casino that he was playing in burnt down. In Montreux. Do you, know, Montreux. How, do you know how it burnt down? It's, uh, somebody let off. I do. I think somebody let off a firework. A firework. No, worse, worse, worse. They let off a, some, it describes as a firecracker, but yeah, obviously, firecracker. A fairly, obviously a fairly significant piece of, you know, a, a munition um, into the roof of the uh, Montreux Casino, where apparently the, the ceiling had been kind of lowered by some kind of raffia arrangement, false ceiling. So it was it was highly combustible paper into which this firework went. So there was, you know, fire was raining down upon the audience, you know, in the middle of the show. So unsurprisingly, they they unbelievable. Cut it short. It? It, it, it's went absolute. through the roof and then died, a deep purple were across the other side of the. Well, yeah, but oh. I mean, first of all, first of all, the amazing thing is that nobody was killed. Yeah, because you you know what health and safety was like at gigs in 1971, non-existent. <laughs> you know, not there will be locked fire doors, all that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, nobody would be thinking about anything like that at all. But it, it, miraculously, everybody got out alive, which is amazing. And the casino burnt down, and Deep Purple were across the across the lake. Where they were recording, um, which album were we talking about? I, 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 I'm sure Deep Purple fans will, will be able to supply that uh, emission. I can't remember. And uh, and they were just looked across across the water and saw the uh, smoke Arcs on the in water. The sky, smoke on the water. That's right. Smoke on the water. Hence, hence the tune. So some good come, came came. Some good it. came up, but Frank, my God, would have run about like all his equipment was destroyed in the fire. Everything. They then went to England and then but played. It, I think because, on the thirtieth of December played the Rainbow. Because where, it, first of all, first of all, the band, unsurprisingly, on, on Montreux, they had a, a you know a hard tour of Europe, hard tour all year. The band, understandably, wanted to go back to the states for Christmas, and he persuaded them. No, we're going to stay. There's two gigs at the Rainbow, and these will pay quite well, and we'll borrow equipment. Can you imagine? This? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they came to London. They borrowed all their equipment, everything. I mean, presumably guitars, keyboards, everything, you know, and and rehearse for a week, and then they go to the Rainbow, and then what happens? At the then, well, then, if I, I remember rightly, the, the, uh, there was a girl who's a major Frank Zappa fan who'd gone along there with her boyfriend. <laughs> And the boyfriend couldn't deal with the fact that she adored Frank to this extent and possibly fancied him. Somehow, well, it wasn't difficult in those days, there wasn't much security, got himself onto the side of the stage, ran across the centre and pushed Frank off. And there was, a, I think, about a 12, 15-foot drop to a solid oh, concrete yeah, absolutely. floor. absolutely, yeah. And, oh, and there were terrible photographs of him kind of lying there, you know, kind of Bust every bone the in his body. The band thought he was dead. He thought he was they, dead. they assumed yeah. anybody pushed off there. It was a high stage of the rainbow. Yeah, it's it like was. You used to have high stages back in those days because they weren't really built for that kind of thing. There were cinemas, really. Yeah. Uh, and so if you went off the uh, the lip of that, you know, you were you were going to the abyss. And um, but miraculously, you know, for the second time in a week or so, uh, he wasn't dead. And he it's, never forgave England, really, did he? he just you kind of can't it. blame him, really. I know, I know. But, you wrote a song called, I see a dancing fool, where he says, I can't dance because I've got one leg shorter than the other or something. I think that's in the lyric. And that refers, of course, to the fact that he was so badly injured in this thing that he actually genuinely did have one leg slightly shorter than the other. Uh, I mean, that's just, just appalling, terrible. isn't it? Anyway, uh, talking about terrible things that happened on stage, well, nothing like as, as terrible as that. But I was interested, interested to know if anybody's, uh, got a similar experience. My son went to, can I call it a gig the other day? He went to the English National Opera. <laughs> it's a gig. Yeah. It's a gig. And uh, he, the, the, um, they're, they're <laughs> mounting the ring cycle. It was first part. Ring about, cycle. Ring cycle. Ring cycle. Yeah. <laughs> do some old. Do some old. <laughs> That's whether you can be guaranteed they will do some old. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> They're not, they're not going to play anything off their new album, are they? No, 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 no. You know what you're getting. Yeah. Anyway, 
anyway, announcement beforehand yeah. that the, the, the guy who was supposed to sing the role of Votan was indisposed because he lost his voice. The understudy had also lost his voice. So they hadn't called off the show. <laughs> They'd flown in from Germany, uh, a third singer capable, you know, up to, up to speed with this role, who then proceeded to sing the, the role during the production. He sang it from off stage while the original actor, performer, who didn't have a voice, went on stage and kind of mimed his part while a guy off stage was actually singing it in, in a different in language. But he's singing in German, was he? didn't know it in English. So having to mime the German part, which no one could understand anyway. <laughs> well, it doesn't really make a lot of difference with opera, understanding the story. No, no, it has. Somebody not. loses a handkerchief and then yeah. find it. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I just thought it was absolutely extraordinary. Somebody in the wings providing the actual music while somebody on stage presents, pretends to be playing it. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't know if anybody's ever come across that. Because they, they, they do say when, he, when Andrew Eldham told Ian Stewart he was too ugly to be in the Rolling Stones, they said he could play the piano as long as he was behind a curtain. Which he uh, did do for a while, Which he, he did do. Uh, yeah. but, but then the kind of screams took over and uh, it no longer mattered whether anybody was playing anything behind a curtain. So, you know, we want to know if you've had that similar, extraordinary kind of understudy singing from the wings experience. We want to know. The Word Podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. So this weekend I've been feeling uh, not quite the full ticket, so retreated to my pit with, uh, you know, something eggy on a tray, bottle of Lucasade. The or Lucasade. Peach you would have. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, now the tenant was it? Smash it, so she used to have something eggy on a something tray. Something eggy on she a tray. She was feeling under the weather. It's yeah. just so funny. And uh, because nowadays when you retreat, you go with your iPad and, you know, you, you think, i got to watch something on Netflix that I've never watched before. <laughs> there are many of those. Ended up watching a documentary yeah. called The Best Worst Thing That Could Have Happened. Which well, I saw is, a bit of that, yeah. Which is absolutely fascinating. I thought it was really fascinating. And basically, the story goes, shall I fill in the background? Yeah, go on. In 1981, uh, in the middle of a string of Broadway hits, Stephen Sondheim and, and his producer, Hal Prince, decided they were going to do an adaptation of, uh, of an old play called Merrily We Roll Along. And it was about tracing people throughout their lives. That was the idea of the play. And they were going to cast it to get, they're going to cast it with entirely unknowns. They did an open audition for anybody 16 to 20 can come and audition for the latest, you know, Stephen Sondheim guaranteed to be on Broadway production. So consequently, every ambitious young person who fancied themselves being able to sing, dance or act turned up to the, the audition. The production was launched. And it was in, an instant failure. So bad, in fact, that the nights was it? Well, they did it. Well, they did the they did the previews, and people actually walked out in the previews. And there's actually footage in this film of people walking song. out during the previews. And then when they did a run, they did like sixteen nights, and then just closed it. And you know, and, and one so, of the principal characters was a guy called Lonnie Price, wasn't he? That was yes. his big break. And that was he he made this. He he's made this documentary. He made this. Well, they, but there's a stage before that. So they thought nothing had ever been heard of Merrily We Roll, Roll Along again, ever. Nobody wanted it. You know, uh, Sondheim didn't want it talked about. Hal Prince didn't want it talked about. Yeah. Because these people who'd done it at the age of 18, 19, 20, when it had seemed they had the world at their feet, it, it was a kind of an experience that just couldn't shake. You know, it was, it was inside them. And so he was the guy that decided 20 years later when he was the kind of artistic director of a, of a theatre that he was going to stage a kind of re-performance of it featuring the original cast 20, 30 years later or whatever it was. And this was so successful, it led to loads and other, loads of other, you know, similar performances and then led to this film, The Best Worst Thing That Could Have Happened. Which it, uses it goes, old footage, doesn't it, of them making, which is incredible. So he's sitting, you see Lonnie, it starts with him watching an interview watching with himself, himself. At the age saying, of 19. This is the great break. If nothing else happens in my life, this is the big break. And I got it. Like, Cam's and so on the, on the film, the, the reason I wanted to mention it is, is that the, the opening of the film is, is, is Lonnie and somebody else going through the boxes of tape 
that have, was shot for a documentary in 1981 that was never screened. Yeah. So he's he started making the documentary. He's got all the people together. He's talked to them. He's talked to Sondheim, all these people. But then he thinks this footage has disappeared. But no, it's turned up. Yeah, it's been found. somewhere in a vault. And this is like when we, were, when we went to see the kind of get back uh, teaser premiere, whatever. They had that footage of uh, of um, the you know, Jonathan Peter Clyde, Jackson, Jonathan yeah. Clyde from Apple going into the vault, and there's all the footage. And so two things struck me: are there other um, things that where you can make a kind of what you might call a revisionist documentary, like Get Back, or well, like a different best, story? Well, yeah, because that is the truth. Because if they're making and this kind of goes back to let it be and get back. You know, it does. If you're making a kind of quick turnaround documentary, and you and I have been involved in these things, yeah. you know, they always want to come out with the same result, which is triumph. You know what I mean? It always finishes with a gig where there's millions of people going mad and the, and the career of the band or the is always going to, is about to step up to another level. Of course, yeah. most things are not like that. Woodstock. Could they could think of all the this footage of Woodstock? I mean, you could it. you could rework the Woodstock, re re nose the entire thing as being an absolute catastrophe. Well, yeah, which yes. right for a lot of people, it was, it was. People on stage. It kind of was in a way, wasn't it? It, it was They're very bravely. I've met people who've been there. Very bravely say it was great, but they don't really remember much about it. No, it's about trying to survive and hoping the made, red parcel with boiled eggs would arrive. You know, what made Woodstock a triumph was the film. Yeah. Because the film presented it as a triumph. Yeah. Even when you, the evidence of your eyes was, was, oh my God, that looks like nightmarish or whatever. Yeah. And um, it struck me. I, I just give you a tiny example. Years ago, I got, I got asked by Level 42 to do a documentary, which the record company was paying for. You know, it was the time of the, they were about to get the big push into America. And, and so they wanted to do a film that kind of tell the story, Levels 42 so far. And finished with them in America. And so they went to shoot a video in the, in the, the bayous of Louisiana. You know, this video, yeah. I can't believe it. You know, we tramped way up into the, into the boondocks to shoot this video on this incredibly hot day. And they went to great trouble to make it look as American as possible, you know. And they were going to tour America. And that was what it was going to be all about. Of course, I think halfway through the process, what inevitably happens happened, which is the bosses at Polydor in America changed, and suddenly Level 42 were not a priority anymore. No, didn't have the funding. So, exactly. So they were stuck with this film that's supposed to be about, about triumph in America. Where there was no triumph in America. It never happened. And I couldn't help thinking as a journalist, this is a better story. It's actually. a much better story. It's because a this, story. this is the truth of what most bands go through. Is yeah, it and then you intercut work. it with interviews with them now, looking back on it and having some kind of hindsight. It'd yeah, be really well, interesting. 30 years later, yeah, whatever it is, 25 yeah. years, years later, it'd be absolutely fascinating. So, and the other thing, the other practical issue, which came to mind when I saw the beginning of, of this documentary with him going through the boxes of, uh, of footage, you know, because all this stuff was shot by ABC, whoever it was, and they were going to put it out as a documentary. As soon as the show closed, they thought, no interest in doing that at all. But so all that stuff has remained in a vault and it is so bulky, the, the material, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, and yeah, you think these boxes. vaults must be taken up with just tons and tons of 99% this stuff. 99% of which will ever, will never be, yeah. never see the light. Well, like except that. you never know. No, you don't. You know. never know. You see, that's what everybody will start thinking post, uh, post get back. It's like everybody started thinking post Beatles anthology. Oh, hang on, don't throw anything away. Yeah, you know, for years they've been throwing stuff away gaily to you know to make space. They won't be doing that anymore. No, they know. won't. And uh, but but give me know, shelter. They could redo. God, there must be some footage yeah, from that. Give me shelter. Last waltz, possibly. Searching for Sugar Man. That's an interesting story because they missed out the whole thing about how he was actually quite big in Australia and all that, you know. Yeah. And, and I think Don't Look Back, the, Dylan, the Pennebaker film about D Dylan, you yeah. could cut a different version of that because they must have masses of material. Well, let's have, I bet they don't. I bet they don't have the stuff. I bet there was just the cut that survived. But, um, you know, I think if you took The Last Waltz, well, so they probably would. I mean, because the thing you do is if you redid The Last Waltz now, you'd tell it from Levon Helm's point of view, wouldn't you? A lot more than it it, it did, you know, because that was 
that was very much in praise of Robbie Robertson, wasn't Completely. it? The last world. Yeah. And uh, it probably wouldn't be quite the same anymore. it was directed anymore. by his mate. No, absolutely. Yeah. You see it from another view. Just on that subject of Get Back, I thought it was a wonderful bit where um, someone tweeted the other day that their mum had appeared in it. Did you see Yes, that? I did. And it's so great because she'd always said, you know, for 50, whatever it is, two years, she said, I was there on the rooftop yep. watching the Beatles. I'm going, oh, yeah, you sure? You know? yeah, and you there she mom. is. You see her, <laughs> identifiably her, looking over a railing, you know. And I love that idea. And I'm, I'm assuming that somebody must be going in there and trying to find the policeman. I mean, by, obviously, by definition, anybody who appeared in that film was interviewed has now got to be at a minimum in their mid-70s. Yeah, yeah. 1969. But you must be able to find the girls in the street, maybe some of the businessmen, yeah. those policemen who, you know, tried to stop them, succeed in stopping the show. You know, the cab driver, all those people. It must be possible to track them down. And well, Alan I, Parsons always used to say, didn't he? I, I, I and he's there. Uh, Alan Parsons, I told him a few years ago. And he said, I was there and I've searched high and low for pictorial well, he evidence. Appears. Part oh, he two, appears. He appears more than once. With He's, a caption. Yeah, yeah, it does. It says because Alan he was, Parsons, he was the tape operator, you know, That's right. in, uh, operator. and he was the person that they sent down from Abbey Road to kind of help, yeah, yeah. help stabilize that thing. So it must be very, very gratifying if you're Alan Parsons or even that, that woman's mother. Oh, it must <laughs> be so thrilling. I see. See yourself there. She must already have a screen grab of that, you know, framed and <laughs> yeah. a you know ab- above the fireplace. I mean, that's We're, just a great moment. Wearing a miniskirt on a roof, that's your it. mum, fifty years ago, waving at Paul McCartney. <laughs> this is a junction in the word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. We're joined by our birthday guest, Patreon supporter Sandra Austin. Sandra, how are you? Great to see you. Good morning, gentlemen. I'm very well, thank you. I hope you are the same. It's beautiful and sunny here in Dublin. So Good hope- grief. Oh, you're very fortunate. It's pretty yeah. gloomy here. Well, we're weak with envy because it's yeah. very, very <laughs> dark and gloomy in London. Don't so you? this is it's your birthday week. Do you have a week of present uh, celebrations? Yes, I generally. Now I start my Christmas countdown from my birthday on. All right, just <laughs> never stops. Yeah, it's a conga line that keeps going till twelfth <laughs> night. Yeah, I can hear I I I I Moosey from here actually. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly. So it. we yeah. we generally ask our, our our birthday guests whether they've got a burning question or anything they'd like to put put to us or to put the to massive the or, or to the panel. What is yours? Do you have one? I do. And I have what they call in academic circles, a question that is timely and relevant. Oh, good. Uh, oh, OK. Well, it comes from actually, Mark, you last year suggested that in your house, everybody plays the Phil Spector, A Christmas Gift for You. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the album. And so I was wondering if you have any more recommendations for seasonal Oh, album. that's good. Oh, well, we do, don't we, Dave? Don't, we've got a classic that we both love. Yeah, that Darlene, Darlene Loves Winter Wonderland, classic on that. <laughs> Fabulous. I think, yeah. I think it must be Santa by Bob Dylan is absolutely <laughs> underrated. It's just oh. hilariously funny. Somebody, Real ra- somebody, rollicking. Somebody <laughs> in, the, in the massive, I, I can't find this, in the, when I was asking for whether people have got questions for uh, to put to the panel. Somebody was saying, is Christmas in your heart? Isn't that the name of the album? I think it is, isn't it? Uh, is it yeah. the, the great underrated Bob Dylan record? I mean, I, I can't say I've listened to it since it came out, but, you know, I'm prepared to believe it is because very often Bob Dylan records are better 10 years later than they are yeah. at the time they come out. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. oh, I've just thought of another one. Quality Street by Nick Lowe, Dave, is fantastic, isn't it? It is. It oh is. Oh, my Nick Lord. Which great. has that thing, a great track called Christmas at the Airport. Christmas at the where Airport. He, doesn't get, he gets snowed in at the airport. He doesn't get home. And there's a lovely line saying, so don't worry about the turkey. I found a burger in the bin. <laughs> it's just the most desolate story about missing You're not Christmas. really selling it to me. <laughs> no, no, it's so, terribly funny, though. Are you, are, you, are you familiar with the later work of Nick Lowe, if we could call it? I mean, it's 20 years ago, probably. You know, you're yeah. not. Not really. I mean, my my understanding of Nick Lowe comes from, he used to support Elvis Costello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that and him on Top of the Pops and stuff, the art Right. Time. Wouldn't really. The later stuff, it rings, it very definitely rings a bell with with gentlemen of a certain age because <laughs> nobody has ever written about, I don't think anybody's even tried to write about the, a, a man in his 50s, as he probably was at the time, pretty much saying, I've screwed it up. I've done yeah. everything wrong. You know, yeah. he, he, write, he, writes, he wrote a song called I'm a Mess, 
Yeah. Which is one of the most honest male songs you could ever possibly imagine. You know? Is that where he goes to the laundry bin and pulls out the cleanest shirt? No, no, yeah, I pull out the cleanest, dirty shirt. Cleanest, dirty shirt. That's right. <laughs> Oh, it's full of all that kind of stuff. It's just it's full of, actually, Leonard Cohen's done it a bit, but but he does it brilliantly. It's completely self lampooning, isn't it? It's just, oh, he's yeah, but I'm, I'm so kind of, good. It's all so over. good. Yeah, I've got to go and yeah. Okay, well that's uh, well that's yeah. Good. It's always just a great a great thing to discover is later Nick Lowe, and if you like it, there's a treasure house of wonderful stuff he did. Uh, my cr- Christmas albums. The um, I was just going to say we're talking about the Spectre Christmas album. Does. Is Darlene Love still with us? Yes, isn't she? She must because be gone. I don't she know. used to turn up on Letterman or one of the chat shows every Christmas. What doing Winter Wonder? Doing no, doing Baby Please Come Home because oh, yeah. that is the great track on that record. And and you'd see her in the sixties and seventies, still turning up. You know, the whole place going mad. People singing along with the Christmas Baby Come Please Come Home. Uh, the other ones I was going to add was John Faye's Christmas guitar, John Fahey. F A F A H E Y, you know the, the yeah. American uh, guitarist, and uh, he may. I think there's actually two records called Christmas Guitar Volume One and Volume Two. Nice. Are they and instrumental? It's they're... just completely instrumental, Lovely. and yeah. it's the perfect thing to put if you want music to put on in the background while you're wrapping presents. Exactly. That's that's uh, that's the music. <laughs> that's the music you want. The the other one that oh, is you the, must mention David Sigerson. That I was going to mention. Oh yeah, Z, Z's Christmas record, uh, the Z Christmas record, which came out I don't know early eighties. Mark, it must be. Yeah, and uh, it's got it's got Christmas wrapping by the waitresses on it, and um, it's probably got a Kid Creole song and so forth. But the key song, which I always think I always think it's interesting to ask people not what's the best Christmas record, but what's the second best Christmas record, because. <laughs> You know, their choice of the best Christmas record will either be Fairy Tale in New-, of New York or Baby Please Come Home. But so, second best will always be something slightly you probably didn't know. And he wrote a thing and, uh, and he, did, he did this song called It's a Big Country. And it's basically in America, you don't get to see your family at Christmas. Because it's a big country. Because they're three thousand miles away. They're all over you the kind place. of never virtually never met them. Yes. And it's lovely. He rings up, doesn't he, and talks to the um, put you put your put your your mother put on your, the phone. Yeah, the kids, yeah. You know. And they one of them I think bakes a loaf of bread and sends it west every year, and it's extraordinary. to help the celebrations. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they and the you know the the kind of uh, the refrain is Merry Christmas, everybody. It's a big country, yeah. and it's but it's also got and I can't. I can't tell whether this is something that's in the record or just something with which we imbue it by listening. It's faintly sad. And I think faint sadness is a key part of Christmas records. It is. Yeah. Do you agree, Sandra? That tinge of melancholy it I is. Like thumbs up the whole spirit of the season because we're all supposed to be really, really happy and joyful. And there's always a little bit of... There's always well, a little... time for reflection, isn't it? And yeah, inevitably, yeah. you look back rather ruefully at various things that have happened that didn't quite work out, you know. Yeah, or people that are gone. or Yeah, yeah, yeah. completely. Yeah. completely. But absolutely. I don't, that's why, you know, uh, have, have yourself a merry little Christmas, you know, which has had a, had a really strange story, hasn't it? Because it got changed. It was in Meet Me in St. Louis and then somebody rewrote it. I don't know. And I was thinking it's got one of the great lines in, um, come next year, we all shall be together if the fates allow. Mm. If the fates allow. It's such a fantastic it line. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so can we say that uh, Ed Sheeran and Elton John's uh, Christmas single is fit, fit to be talked of in that company? <laughs> Have you seen that? So there's an official it video. Oh, it's hilarious because it's one of those, it could not be more corny. Oh. You know, the colour is turned up. There they are on this kind of crimson and green setting, this wonderful kind of living room in Elton at the piano. And there's, there's a ring of stockings hanging from the mantelpiece and there's a blazing hearth and there's Christmas trees and winking lights and all that. You know, it is unbelievably corny, isn't it? And the camera pans oh, by. God. And you notice that Elton is actually having to read the lyrics off a... Off a piece of paper. I was going to say that. No, he, he presumably wrote the song about He's, 10 minutes beforehand. They were presumably reading the lyrics. They presumably Ed Sheeran will have written the lyrics because yeah. there's no Bernie Taupin. So we must assume. And I saw this. 
I saw, I saw uh, he's miming, and I think he keeps looking down. He keeps looking down, which is very use, yeah, unusual in, in in miming on a video because yeah. usually by the time they do a video, they know it so well they don't need to. And other, and as the camera pans round, you think, am I going to see the the piano, the music stand, <laughs> and you do with the scrappy bit of paper on it, and you do, you actually do, and there are the words. <laughs> it's hilarious. And the it's snow, so cool. The snow is coming, coming down, or you know, fake and otherwise. And Elton is wearing sunglasses throughout. He is. It's indoors. So, so it's not Christmas. corny in a heartwarming, Christmassy, we, we're all schmaltzy together kind of way. It is just. It's corny in a kind right. of little drummer boy, Bing Crosby, David Bowie way. You know, it's that kind of here we are, the crackling half, you know, every, every little cliche. It is hilarious. I mean, I'm sure. It I actually didn't well. think it's too bad. I thought it is pretty bland and so forth. But I watched it and listened to it. I, th- I thought it was all right, you know. If you if you can have a Christmas number one, let it be a Christmas number one rather than <laughs> let yeah. it be Merry Christmas everybody by Slade. Surely. Yes, <laughs> that's what you want. <laughs> oh, man. Well, the Wham well, man. record wasn't bad. Good oh, they were really. How do you? Where do you stand on the Wham record? Because because around that this time of year, some people run kind of Wham last Christmas. Uh, you know, bingo. Can they get through the whole festive season without hearing without hearing Wham's it? Lane, Wham's well, the only way to do is what stay in an attic with covered in a big duvet, I suppose, isn't it? For, uh, it, it for is, a week, really. you know. I, I think it's fairly inoffensive, actually. I don't All right, think okay, it fine. Bother me any more than any of the other ones when it comes on in when I'm in the shops and buying right. socks and things. What's your favourite Christmas record? I don't know. I I like the kind of quirky ones. I like. Um, uh, you know the Merry Christmas, but I think I'll skip this one this year. I like that oh, one. All right, you know? okay. Yeah. Um, Who was that? Oh, I don't know. It was somebody in the eighties. All right, her, I remember uh, that one. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that that, and I suppose, like, yeah, I'm a bit sick of the old fairy tale, the F word. Oh, uh, F word. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I, you can't get sick of that. You oh, can't get sick of that. Can That's you? a good one. Well, I don't know. I get sick of all the controversy about it, I suppose. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you hear on the radio, you think, you get half of it, you think, something's gone wrong. They've snipped something <laughs> out of that yeah, yeah, or, yeah. or dropped a word in or, or whatever. The, the, think- the thing about Mary Gay, fairy tale in New York, and I got over this. I interviewed Steve Lillywhite, the producer, who produced that record um, for um, one of these things about 10 years ago or whatever. And he was in the house he used to live in with Kirsty McCall in Ealing and the little studio up on the top floor and just tiny little place. He said, this is where she did the vocal. <laughs> you know, So it's, it's the idea, you know, it's, it's like she barely met the Pogues. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you think of it, you know, you, you listen to that record and you see them all together and you see it being acted out and, and Shane McGowan and Kirsten McCall. And no, he was in Dublin. Well, no, she, she didn't leave until after it came out. That's right. And then she did do a few shows with them. She'd appear for that song. But she right. after them, they hadn't met. It was the idea of it being done in an attic in Ealing. Yeah. That seems the most, most extraordinary. And Shane heard her vocal and was so uh, so impressed. He went back and completely re-recorded all the ones he'd done before. Oh, and did it really? Just thought, yeah, he thought that's just not good enough because it's brilliant, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a tune. It's a great yeah, tune. It's a fantastic tune. And they should stop mustn't messing about with it. So yeah. what, what have you got planned for your week of, uh, of celebrations? What the high point? Well, fingers crossed, uh, I'm flying to New York on Oh, Thursday. my goodness. Wow. So That's that was exciting. my other question to you was, have you any recommendations for what I have to do, absolutely must do? In New York. New York. New York's such a changed place nowadays because all, all the kind of diners and places like that that I used to frequent are I know. not there anymore. Well, I haven't been for about six years. I can't remember that, more than that. I'll I, I tell you the one thing. I, when, last time I was there, and this was a new thing when I was there, but it's less five or ten years, whatever, which I would recommend to do, is the High Line Walk. Oh, yes. I have never seen that. I've, 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 uh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. a, a walk down one side of the island kind of thing. And you see New York in a very different way. And it's it's just a lovely, you know, general amusement and, and facility. And rent so, a bike, too. Rent a bike and, and you can cycle over to Brooklyn and all that. It's fantastic. In four hours, you can do the whole city. I have we went, last, well, years ago, when our kids were little, we went and spent New Year there. 
and we went to see the ball and kind of where is it Times Square? Yeah, that was pretty. Square. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty exciting. It's kind of, it doesn't make any sense to us in the same way that British traditions wouldn't make a lot of sense to people from other countries. But it was very thrilling. It was great. We went with the and kids years ago. We went to went just before Christmas with the kids, and we went to the Christmas show at Radio City Musical, oh, cool. which I would recommend. Actually. Yeah, because if only because you get to see the Radio City Rockets, you know, <laughs> high kicking across the stage. There's about forty of them, you know, the tallest women you've ever seen in your life, uh, and and they do do a kind of nativity parade where an elephant does come on the stage. Yes. Seriously, That's it's an expensive ticket, but you know, it's unforgettable. You know, once in a lifetime, absolutely once in a lifetime. Yeah. So, Sandra, well, do that, and you know, uh, I hope your trip goes ahead, and I hope you have a really nice birthday. The Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink, and it's like being in the pub. So, any other business? We're joined by Alex Geld. Hello, Alex. Hello, greetings. Hey, Magic. All Alex, right, have you got your um, this time of year? Spotify send you an accounting yes. of uh, of the tunes you've played most in the year two thousand twenty one, and I'm going to ask you, Alex Gold, to uh, run down the top twenty from ten to a uh, top ten from ten to one in reverse order. Okay, top ten. Here, oh, top ten. Yeah, go on. Go okay, though, but I will add a disclaimer. Oh, come on, come on, oh, come on, just right, do right. it. Come on, do no, no, it. Fine. no, 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 dis- don't give me your disclaimers. Come on, top 10, reverse order. Yeah, go on. Toe Rag by the Magic Midgets. Very good, keep going. Okay, that's good. Can't Buy Me Love by the Beatles. Very good. I've yeah. heard of them. Go on, Stay With Me Baby, Steve Marriott. Oh, not okay. Lorraine Ellison. Okay, fine, go on. Stay With Me by the Faces. Right, that's a theme here. <laughs> Last Night by The Strokes. All right, okay. That's Alex Gold. Go on. Love Me Do by The Beatles. All right, very good. I Want to Hold Your Hand. Is that a lot of this is your research for playing the part of a Beatle in a Beatles well, group, isn't well, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, there you go. She Loves You by yep. The Beatles. Never heard that one. Go on. Reptilia by The Strokes. There you go. Okay. She okay. Loves You by The Beatles. Reptilia by The Strokes. Mm. Perfect segue. Okay. Se- se- they're second cousins. Um, and at number one, my most listened to song this year. Do you want to hazard, hazard a guess? Uh, is it by the Beatles? Is it by... It's not. It's by Humble Pie. Bar- and it's Natural Bar- Born Bar- Is it Natural oh, right. Born Bar- far off. Oh, yeah. yeah that's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I can explain this top but ten because you I... Don't I don't have... You don't, that, Alex, the point about top tens is they explain themselves. No, no. But the thing I should think I should explain is this will be little bits of songs. This will not be songs I've listened to all oh, the way okay. through. Okay. It doesn't matter. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Playing a guitar solo over and over again till I get it. So, um, yeah, I, I, I read this list and I'm, I'm not quite sure who I am anymore and what I actually do like. No, it's really. very clear who you are. Good, we right. like it. We are you going next, Mark? Or am I, well, I can, I'll do oh, yeah. mine. T- again, I don't listen to Spotify that much, actually. But okay. they are. They are playing lots of other things. instead. But So the ones I've got, the 10th was Ricky Don't Lose That Number by Steely Dan. They're quite good. Yeah. They are Dreaming of You by The Coral is nine. Oh, All banger. Along the Watchtower by Jimi Hendrix. Why? I don't know why, but there it is. It's quite a good record. Yeah. Is You Is or Is You Ain't My Baby by Louis Jordan. Yeah, that's that's Mark Allen. That's very Mark Allen. <laughs> Fractal Zoom by Brian Eno, which I, I still believe is the greatest electronic dance track ever, oh, really? ever, ever invented. Oh, Go so from that to Daydream, Daydream by Love and Spoonful. Being yeah. Boring by Pet Shop Boys, You Gotta Believe by Dan Hicks and his hot legs, hot legs. Second is Age of Revolution by the Duckworth Lewis, oh, Martin, which is absolutely yes. just a most. But I think these are just songs that just cheer me up and I like hearing them. And top actually is the rooftop version of, uh, of Don't Let Me Down, which I guess I've been listening to quite a lot. Oh, that's so fantastic. So amazing. There you are. Go on, give that's us a really list. good. I don't, I'm not sure if I've got 10 here. Giving Up Food for Funk by the JBs. Brahms Symphony number four. Um, Generique from Miles Davis from a film soundtrack. Um, Goodbye Pork Pie Hat by Charlie Mengus. Take Off by Miles Davis. Jolene Dolly Parton. Round Ooh. Midnight by Miles Davis. And then the top two are yeah. The Lonely Goat Herd from the Sound of Music soundtrack. Uh, and then number one, Do Re Me from the uh, Sound of Music oh, soundtrack. Wow. Oh, that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the grandfather in action. That's what were your fantastic. Spotify auras? What does so Spotify gives you an aura based on what does you've it? been listening to? Yeah, apparently mine is boisterous and spooky. Oh, oh, God, right. I don't where do I look them up? I don't know. Oh, well, yeah. 
I'll have to have a look at that later. All right, find that. Boisterous and spooky. That's good. It will show you somewhere in your app. So, yeah, have a look. And Spotify will will find you. Very nice. Yeah, I'm really glad we did that. That's that was really interesting. It is. And, I love uh, that. That's great. Sound of music meets Miles Davis and Dolly Parton. Very good. <laughs> that's that's the sound of our house. Yeah. So uh questions from the massive. Um John Dredge wanted to know who has the most shocking perm in pop. I saw that-, that question. That's good. <laughs> it is that's good. good. Is it worse than Eric Clapton? Do you remember Eric Clapton? Well, we'll come back to that because oh. I went back to John and I said. What were you thinking of yourself when you came up with the question? He said, Gordon Giltrap. Oh, yes. <laughs> Which I, I have to confess I'd forgotten. Yes, and then, and then somebody pointed out, because the thing about perms is you have a tendency to forget them. They go through periods where people have perms and then they don't anymore. And then this, this person pointed out that uh, George Harrison had a perm. He did. Oh, Shocking yes. One. Was that in the 80s, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was uh, really awful. Just terrible. Oh, I mean, no. how on George Harrison move is that? But the other thing, I was like, get back to the Eric Clapton. I mean, there was a time in 1967, I Still Hold was a moment never to be repeated in popular music because only on that one occasion did just about everybody overnight decide that they had to look different. Yeah, they did. It, it just, you know, suddenly bands who just, who previously been turning up in suits and jeans and whatever, suddenly turned up and, you know, they, like they'd raided the fancy dress box and they were wearing... <laughs> and it dark. really was like that. It really was like that. Noel the, Redding and Mitch Mitchell, good examples of that. And uh, and and it, if you look at, there are pictures of Eric Clapton in cream with this ridiculous perm. It, it just looks absolutely absurd. And right about the same time, I think the move, I don't think Roy Wood ever had... No, one. Jeff Lynn did. Jeff Lynn probably did. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. shocking perm. Yeah, yeah, he did. <laughs> and I think Leo say unless that was naturally curly, I really got no idea. Could have yeah, been. but that would be a bit later, wouldn't it, really? Yeah. yeah. But um, but I'd forgotten about George Harrison, and uh, and I was very glad to be reminded of that. Moustache. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very poor. So if anybody's got any more suggestions of... Um, of, of perms in rock, you know, particularly outstanding perms in rock. It was also from James Carter... Alex got uh, follow up to the um, the thing where we were talking about the genre called Sawyer Billy. Oh yes, did yes, you yes, see yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Alex was doing a thing last week um, about are these real genres or has he just made them up? And one was Sawyer Billy, and uh, James Carter and his mates have gone through. Uh, they, they've um, worked out its key vegan components, exponents. Sorry, who would be here? Here we go. Sawyer Wilcox, very good. <laughs> it is, it's good. Bob Marmite and the Wafers, <laughs> Leo Sawyer, nice, yes, excellent. Tofu, tofu, fighters. Fi- yes. tofu fighters, of course. Fighters. Milk Almond, um, Sheila Bean <laughs> Devotion. Milk Almond is very, that's very good. Milk that's Almond, double header. Sheila Bean Devotion, Corn yeah. Rider. And the happy mung beans. That's happy all very, mung beans. Happy That's mung amazing. Beans. That's, That's really all very good, good stuff. So, yeah, Alex, you good. said you had something to put to uh, some question from the massive. Yeah, I've got one panel. from um, Dara O'Halloran, who's a patron. Um, yeah. This is coming via email. Right. And he wants to know uh, who is the most reclusive major recording artist, i.e., the person who achieved huge success in their career but has remained completely out of the public eye for many years. He's gonna. He suggests either Bobby Gentry or John Deacon of Queen. Bobby Gentry. Well, John good Deacon's one. retired, isn't he? He's John retired. Deacon sits in a deck chair in the south of France, counting his enormous royalties. Good yeah, for him. Yeah. I don't think he actually plays. I don't no, think. he's quite right about Bobby Gentry because that goes back a long, long way. Um, that's late sixties, isn't it? When she, when she yeah. just kind of disappeared. Could I put uh, forth Lee Mathers? All right. Okay. The Lars. Yeah. So how is he long still, is he still recording? No, he made the one album in... When, when did the last album come out? Was it 91? Uh, and then he, he, I think, did six months and disappeared. He's been living <laughs> off There She Goes. Off, quite quite right. Well, why not? That's Can great. Imagine every time that gets used on a radio trail or a, yeah, you know, a TV a brilliant package song. or whatever, he gets a little check for that. Oh, my goodness. That's that's very good. Yeah. Uh, no, I think but so. John Deacon um, and uh, Bobby Gentry and um, and Lee Mathers. 
Um, I can't think of any any others really off the top of my head who, who utterly who utterly withdrew. No, um, not really. Maybe, maybe you. Mark Hollis did a bit, didn't he? But I think he's no longer with us. Sadly, you know, Mark Hollis. He did. Talk, talk. He did, didn't he? he kind yeah. of put out a few records, but just we never heard a thing about him. You know. Um, yeah. Yeah. He just didn't like the limelight. Fair enough. Andrew F says is asking about the phenomenon of signed and limited edition albums. They're everywhere and come constantly seeing ads for signed copies of the new Tom Jones album. My wife got a copy of Taylor Swift's new CD signed by, for her just for standard price. Great for collectors. But is it that hard to sell physical media now? I think the answer, Andrew, the answer is yes, it yes, is. it is. God, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the same thing with books, isn't it? Yeah, it I is. remember I remember overhearing Stephen Fry at a book festival once saying to somebody, someone said, oh, I've got a, a signed copy of your book. And he said, uh, he said, uh, unsigned ones are the ones that have real value. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Great, because you, you automatically sign absolutely everything. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it's, uh, it's, so, it's, no, that's an indication that, that, that anything you can do to shift the thing, shift the unit, you do, you know. Well, also, they assign stuff to, a, a, you know, and they... they um, uh, distribute it to certain retailers or yeah. to certain online outlets so they know they know it'll go it'll be worked it won't just disappear into the supply chain but uh, but yeah that is quite something that is what the taylor swift so taylor swift how do you i mean signing cds for a start is a kind of hard thing to do well, cause what do you do you take the inlay card out of the out of the plastic thing i suppose you could yeah. sign the jewel case couldn't you well i, don't, well, yeah, I suppose it's a, you could do it it's pretty yeah but, you know, it's I think not, more often than not, it's yeah, it's either on the CD itself or on the on the inlay. Yeah, yeah. So Phil, uh, Phil Turner, that we've already talked about this with Sandra. Actually, any views on Elton John, Ed Sheeran, a Christmas yeah. song? I, I, I said, uh, I said, um, you know, we we've said that. Uh, what else have we got? We got coming up, Alex. We got uh, what are our Christmas plans, Alex? Over to you. Well, we we are um, going to be running a Christmas Patreon only event, aren't we? On on Boxing Day. Yeah, which is called Has He has, Been Yet? Has He Been? Has He, has been? he been, yet? been Yet? We did it last year, as you did during lockdown. We did it last year. I remember five o'clock, all a bit, all a bit squiffy with, uh, you know, with paper hats on. And uh, it'll be the same thing. Has have He Been? People holding up dressing gowns or, or limited edition Dan Hicks reissues or yeah. <laughs> God knows what. It's, it's, very, it's an opportunity to touch base. So we're doing that on Boxing. Tell us when we're doing that, Alex. You'll know all about it, Con. We're doing it, we'll be doing it around 6 p.m. on Boxing Day. Um, okay. Good. When we're all full of um, leftover turkey. Well, not me, leftover nut roast and uh, sparkling <laughs> wine. And, uh, okay. Well, look, that's about it for this week. Oh, hang on a oh, second. On. We, we, we have on. some more patrons. Oh, um, good. Go on. Go on. So, go on, um, go on. Let's go welcome on, them on. to the fold. Uh, yes. Lawrence Howell. Very good, Lawrence. Thank you. Mark Casali. Bless you, Gov. <laughs> <laughs> Fergal Kinney. Hello, Hello Virgil. Colin Mack. Good Hello, man. Colin. That's great. Dan James. Splendid. Pull, pull up a scatter cushion. Nick Bora. Hello, Nick. Good man. David Mutter. Hi, David. Travels Hi, David. all round. Yeah. Wayne Wilmot. Well, Wayne Wilmot. This is That's excellent. a fine name. And these following patrons are annual patrons. So oh, if you right. subscribe annually, you get a 15% discount. It's uh, right. Sarah Leclerc. Hello, Sarah. Excellent. Peter Thomas. Hello, Peter. Very good. Stephen Chambers. Stephen Chambers. Steve Peachy. Steve Peachy. And Christopher Leach. Very nice. Well, to have very on board. very That's nice. Great. To have That's them all on board. Huge. And if, you know, so if you haven't already done so, now's the time to be thinking about giving yourself a Christmas present or possibly suggesting to your significant other that they may wish to do the same thing for you that, you know, this Christmas by signing up to be a wait a word Patreon supporter. And if you do it at the right level, we actually shin down your digital drain pipe and go through your record <laughs> collections on the occasion of your birthday. But there's also lots more, you know, Patreon specific um, material. Uh, Mark and I are slowly treating the world to our views on Get Back part by part, uh, which is exclusively to Patreon supporters. So if you want to join those people, uh, patreon.com slash word in your ear. Is that it? This podcast was brought to you by The Word. 